me and my younger sister had this huge open field behind our house. The space was seemingly endless, and we would often spend our summers and vacations exploring all the back fields. These fields went on for a while, and I'd say after about three miles, led to some decently sized hills. We often would enjoy hiking, just because there was nothing better to do where we lived. When this story occurred, I was only 14 and my sister 11. It was your average Saturday, and we had packed up our picnic, as making it was half the fun, and we're going to find a decent spot to eat it at while making our way through the fields. Both my parents had extremely demanding jobs. My mother worked on Saturdays all day pretty much, and my dad had more work to catch up on. So he'd be home plowing away on his laptop while we would go out. There's no cell phone service a little further past our house. So our phones were pretty much useless, but we took them just in case through some sort of miracle that we got signal and in case of an emergency. It was your average day. We'd walked past the fields and gotten to the hills. That's when we went a different route. My sister said that she saw something on the floor, something shiny. We made our way and found a little less traveled path. We'd never come this way. I don't know why, we just never decided to explore this part. She tells me that she wants to go this way, as the shiny thing had brought her luck, and this way was the right way to go. When she showed me what she'd found, it appeared to be a chip, the likes of which you might see inside a phone or a computer. So someone had obviously broken something and scattered whatever electronic device this was all around the woods, which is weird enough. We carried on with our hike, my sister leading. And the path became even more ruggedy as the hills got steeper, going up and down. Part of the fun for me was going to places I didn't know, but something about this hike made me feel uneasy. I wasn't entirely sure what, but my sister seemed happy, so I followed her without complaint. We'd been gone for at least four hours now, and as anyone who's hiked knows, four hours of walking and hiking will certainly make your stomach grumble. I tell my sister that I'm hungry, and to eat the sandwiches and snacks that we had packed. We look around for a decent place to eat, perhaps a log or a rock, but right now there didn't seem to be anything as comfortable. We carried on for approximately five minutes before we found a decently sized fallen log that we could comfortably sit on. My sister pulled out the sandwiches and snacks from my backpack, got the drinks, and we started chatting, eating, and generally having a good time. This spot where we had stopped wasn't anything special, but as we spoke, I heard something strange. I asked her to stop munching for a moment, and I heard a sound like the snapping of a twig. I looked frantically in all directions, but was met with nothing. There was a slight echo to the sound too, a reverberance that made me shudder. I looked around again. The sound seemed to be coming from a bit further down, directly below us. We were almost at the crest of a hill, and we couldn't see far down, especially not to where this was. But as we looked down, we could see that it was easy enough to go down and investigate the source of this sound. I was curious, but my sister didn't want to come. She said it sounded scary, like something was biting bones. I laughed at her, told her she was being ridiculous, but had no intention of going off in a hurry as my sandwich was still half eaten 
and I had a cereal bar and more snacks to devour before I even thought about moving from my spot. About 20 minutes had passed, and the sound by this point had stopped. I was still curious, and begged my sister to come with me. She refused, and so I started making my way round, and when she realized how far I was, did she scream that she was coming to, and chase after me. We make our way down, and this is when we see the opening of a small cave, almost like a crack in the stone of this hillside. We look at each other. I pull out my phone and illuminate with a flashlight the crevice-like space. We inch closer, being very careful to walk quietly as to not spook whatever was making that sound. By this point, I just thought it was an animal, and where we live, we don't have anything dangerous, so I wasn't worried, I was just interested to see what there was. I poke my phone in further, peering, trying as hard as I can to focus in the dark. And as we get closer, I notice that the cave is actually larger than I'd expected. My sister holds my hand in fright, as we make our way into the darkness. I flash around, but my phone light isn't very strong, and only illuminates a little bit ahead of us. I listen, and there's a rustling in the back. My sister squeaks the sound frightening her, and tugs on my arm that she wants to leave, but I pull back, and with a look, tell her that I want to keep going. The ground was ordinary, and after a few steps, do we crunch with our feet and look down. There was a small animal bone on the ground. My sister goes, Ew! and pulls me again, insisting that we leave. I shine my phone around one more time. This cave is big, and it's not worth upsetting my sister to explore it. Maybe I'll come another day alone, I think to myself. I let her pull me away, and that's when she stops. I heard it too. Something made a sound in the cave. I turn my flashlight in that direction, when I see a man stand. He is completely naked, although I couldn't make everything out in high detail, as, like I said, the illumination from my phone isn't the best. We stand there frozen for a second, before my sister jolts me, and we run. The man just stands there. When we reach the mouth of the cave, which is only wide enough for one person to go through at a time, my heart is thumping out my chest. I push my sister through, and in the moment I have to spare as her butt is going up, I turn around and look at him. He's still standing there from his perch, looking at us. I just about crap myself, scream, and we run, for about 20 minutes straight, before my sister breaks down crying and scolds me, telling me that we should have never have gone in there. When we get home, fatigued and annoyed at each other, we both rush to tell my dad what happened. I tell him what we saw, and as does my sister, she also saying how important it was to know that it was my idea to go in there in the first place. My dad didn't believe us. He said there's no reason for a man to be hiding in a cave, and kind of dismissed us and shooed us away. And that was that. We went to bed that night, sulky that our dad didn't believe us. But the next day in the morning, as we're having breakfast, a police car shows up. The police officer sits us down and asks us a few questions pertaining to what we saw. We give him a vague idea of where this cave was, and tell him about the man that was naked, and the fact that we'd stepped on bones. He gives me a worried look, says thank you for my help, and is off. It turns out my dad called the police, 
as he was worried and just didn't want to frighten us by believing our story and admitted to this later that day. A few weeks later, we see on the news that a man has been caught. I didn't know if it was him or not, but they mentioned that he'd been living out in the woods and avoiding police capture for about three months. He was wanted for the murder of his mother. I'm so glad that we ran when we did. And I will always regret putting my sister and myself in that danger. Were we close to death? I suppose I'll never know. But I am very glad indeed that we didn't have the opportunity to find out. This happened quite recently. Today, we planned on going on a four mile hike. The trail makes a big loop, with the beginning point also acting as the ending point. The story begins in the trail parking lot. There were about five other cars in the lot, and out of the car nearest us came a middle-aged couple. We paid them no mind, as we typically do with strangers, and we headed off to the restroom before hitting the trail. They set off on their own hike. When we started to hike, we chose route number one, doing the loop counterclockwise. The trail itself makes a huge loop about four miles in length, with the parking lot being at the highest elevation and the lowest point being the middle of the trail. The ascent from the bottom middle section to the top going in either direction is extremely steep, slow, slippery, and tough. About 20 minutes into our overall three hour hike, we reached point A, where we caught up with the older couple. About the time we caught up to them in the canyon, they decided to turn back towards the parking lot, passing us along the way. We exchanged smiles and waved as we passed, and again thought nothing of it. From point A to point B, everything seemed totally normal. We were hot and tired, of course, but were enjoying ourselves and thought very little about the other couple. When we reached point B, about two thirds of the way through the loop, just starting the uphill climb back towards the parking lot. However, things started to get a little weird. As soon as we exited the low lying canyon region, we saw the same couple heading towards us as if they had returned to the parking lot and opted instead for route two. We still didn't find this completely out of the ordinary as the first canyon around point A was tough to get down, and it seemed that they were somewhat unprepared. The woman was wearing a knee length skirt, which is a bad choice for slippery canyon slopes and climbing steep rocky bluffs, and it appeared they had not brought a pack with water or anything. We passed them again, exchanged pleasantries and continued on. This time though, we did talk briefly about the situation, we found it odd that they made it far enough to meet us at this point, as the first parts of routes one and two were steep and slow, and the area between point A and B was pretty flat and steady. Considering the difference in terrain and their age slash apparent physical conditions, we agreed it was awfully strange to see them at that point on the trail, but we continued anyway, just shrugging it off and thinking nothing more about it. Soon afterwards, we made our way to the outlook, which was a few hundred feet above the bottom section of the trail, and 10 minutes past point B. As we paused to take some pictures and catch our breath, my wife pointed out that she could hear their voices down below in the canyon as we rested. We listened, and mutually agreed that it was probably the same couple, since the point the voices seemed to come from would be about the right spot for them, given the last location we saw them at, and the lack of anyone else on the trail so far. Still nothing too strange yet, that is until we reached point C. Between the outlook and point C, which was 20 minutes from the end of the loop, and 40 minutes past point B, was a wide gravel trail, 
with steep drop-offs on either side. You could say it was a sort of ridge, as everything within the loop made a giant lopsided bowl much like a volcano, with the elevation difference between the lowest point of the trail and the highest point of the trail, being about 500 feet. This made the terrain around the trail seem pretty much impassable. It was extremely steep and covered in thick undergrowth and fallen trees. It seemed to be pretty much a given that the established trail is the only way to get from the outlook back to the parking lot. As we neared point C, we were becoming increasingly exhausted and ready to be done. We stopped once or twice for about 30 seconds apiece to catch our breath. And as we got closer and closer to point C, it was as if the energy was sucked out of both of us. Of course, the trail was tough, but we had done it and many like it before, and it wasn't even 80 degrees outside. Even as our mental focus began to waver, and we started noticing a significant change in our demeanor and attitude, we still marched on, knowing the end of the trail was near. When we reached point C, everything changed for the worse. Now keep in mind we saw the older couple about 40 minutes earlier past point B, and there was no way to reach point C from there except the trail that we were currently on. There were no shortcuts, there was no realistic way to pass us without us knowing and no way to possibly beat us there. And yet there they were, sitting on a bench on the side of the trail eating lunch. As we passed them, the man mentioned something about a picnic to us and smiled, laughing. We tried our best to respond in kind, but the mood was as if we had just walked into a giant black cloud of smoke. I'm not really sure how to explain it, but the area around them disoriented us completely and we were no doubt as pale as ghosts and obviously shaken. It wasn't a malevolent feeling, and they didn't seem aggressive or strange, but our brains were just shocked into a state of horror in seeing them there. It just wasn't possible. We passed on by them, and as soon as we were out of earshot, my wife turned to me with a face I had never seen before in my life. We were terrified. Without saying a word to each other, we both experienced the same feeling of shock. It felt as if we had just walked through a time warp, or brushed against another dimension. Our following discussion amounted to this, that there is no way they could have beaten us there. Sure, maybe, possibly, just maybe there was a chance, but only if after seeing us at point B, they sprinted through the woods in a direct line towards point C. Now this would require them to run up steep rock bluffs through unmarked woods and who knows whatever else for over a mile. In 40 minutes. That's how long it took us to get there, going at a pretty good speed clearing our usual trail, which, as crows fly, was not that much longer than a direct route between B and C. We were in our early 20s and in decent shape, and we were dead tired by the time we saw them and based on their apparent level of preparedness and fitness, there's no way, even if they did take a direct off trail route, they could have made it there before us. On top of that, they had somehow found two Bud Lights and a lunchbox full of sandwiches on the way, and were almost already done eating them by the time we met them at point C. All of these things combined, with the overwhelming feeling we got when we encountered them at point C, have left us in mental shambles for the past few hours. We have no idea what to make of this, and no clue how to explain it in a way that even begins to make sense. So, weird hikers, I hope not to encounter you again. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university, and needed some extra curricular stuff I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek through woodland and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass. 
No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together. I was out of shape at the time, and so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight, like what I would have done during the real thing, but we hiked maybe 10 miles through woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back in the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill, with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onwards in silence at this point, when all of a sudden, there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit, with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He appeared to be in his late 70s to early 80s, very pale with liver spots dotting his face, and a grey white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that and goes into the woods? The instant thought seeing a guy his age out there in those clothes in this weather was that he had lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice that puzzled me. The guy was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen and shocked as seeing us as we were for seeing him. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking him if he was alright. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened, and that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk, then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After perhaps a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so continued to follow the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge, and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down at the slope that was presumably at a 40 degree angle, spanned for perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given that there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope, and wondering how the heck did he cross that so cleanly and quickly. I mean, all that distance is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear, he still did not appear to be wet or muddy in the slightest. Me and my uncle looked at each other, and I saw that he was getting weirded out, as was I. Despite my feelings, I made a step towards the edge, and was going to try and make my way down this, when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm, and pulled me back. Under his breath, he said to me, Something's wrong here. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting irate. He began pleading with us to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we would head back to our car and call the emergency services for him that professional help would be on its way soon, and that they would have all the tools they needed. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now or there would be hell to pay. His voice has drastically changed. He was practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry schoolboy throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a fully grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. 
His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out their sockets. His skin gone from pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came. His demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter of a mile or so to the car. All the while, my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possible mentally ill old man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get into our car and await the police, so that we could show them where we had encountered him. An hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets and the like. We led them to the exact spot, and then pointed to the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. The search lasted all weekend, but there was no trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. This has been one of my weirdest experiences to date. My name is Jack. This story took place outside Minot, North Dakota when I was 17. My church group was having a backyard bash, basically all the ones who play music in the surrounding congregation in North Dakota get together and one of the members backyards and play music, cook awesome food and hang out with some truly great people. This took place the night before. All the guys my age were hanging out late at Jared's house. If any of you are familiar with Minot, this took place across the Bison Trail before Velna. Anyway, that night all the guys were watching Hot Rod inside at about 11pm. Evan, Jared, Tyler, my younger brother and myself decided to go outside and talk and hang out by Evan's girly truck he was way too proud of. His house was on a hill. The driveway went about a hundred feet where Evan's truck was parked. The front yard slowly declined to the road and field, flattened out for about 300 feet, then inclined up a sizable hill. It was pitch black at the time. We were all around Evan's truck, just chatting and having fun. 20 minutes into our conversation, Evan interrupts us and asks if we heard that. We all stopped and said no. I asked what he heard, and he said it sounded like a deep, grunting grasp noise. We all listened for anything and heard nothing but bugs, so we brushed it off. But Evans seemed uneasy. Another 10 minutes into our chat, and we all stopped talking naturally, as we paused to think about what to talk about. And just then we heard it again, all of us in unison. The noise was this deep grunt exhale noise that had all of us stop and look towards the direction it came from. We didn't see anything. Evan had his keys and decided to turn on his headlights as it was parked in the right direction. We saw a pair of eyes shining in the light just on the outside reach of his headlights about 400 feet away. I ran inside to grab a mag light. You know, the most recognizable flashlight ever created? And I ran to the edge of the road and Jared came along. I twisted the end to focus the light in a straight beam and found it. A white tailed buck, a big one climbing up the hill from bottom right to top left. I found the animal with the beam focused on it and we were about 250 feet away. The deer stopped and stared at us. I started talking to it, just saying the usual things. Hey buddy, what are you doing out here? And after about two minutes of us talking to him and him just staring at us, it started to resume its course. But then we heard that same noise again, a grunt, a deep exhale. Jared and I looked at each other puzzled and I put the light on him again while he was walking up the hill. But something was wrong. It was limping badly. We knew something was wrong, and that's when it happened. We heard a roar 50 feet from our right, the scariest sound I've ever heard. But I've heard it before, 
in movies and games. Mountain Lion. It was the first time hearing it in person, but I knew it was angry, basically saying get the hell away from my meal or I'll have you for dessert. When it roared, Jared and I looked at each other and booked it back to the house. Tyler and Evan were still by the truck while we were down there, but they reacted the same way we did because when we passed the truck in our retreat, they were holding the house door open for us. We told a few of the guys that we were still up and nobody bought it, but we knew what we saw and heard. Mountain lions three miles outside of town in North Dakota? Yeah, okay, I know they're rare, but they're there. We were pretty shaken about it, but the next morning my brother and I went to go look for tracks, blood trails or carcasses. We got to the point where we found the deer, we were walking up to where I put my arm out in front of my brother to stop us both, and I heard a rattling. I then saw a rattlesnake pop up 10 feet away, and decided the universe was giving us stop signs, so we went back. I lost contact with Jared over time. Evan turned out to be a pretty messed up person that I didn't want to be around anymore, but my brother and I are still close, and we talk about that night to this day. Mountain lions are my favorite animal. And from this encounter, I have the utmost respect for them. But after this night, I never went out hiking, biking or walking in that area without protection for a fight I would lose because I have a feeling I would not get a second warning. This happened a little over a year ago on a Sunday early in the morning. I live in the suburbs, but my parents own a farm that I enjoy going to because I get to see my dog. Molly. She's a mutt, but she's not a tiny dog by any means. At that time, I felt very safe around her and would often take her for walks in a forest that was nearby. The day started off like any other. Me and my dad got in the car, drove around for a while and arrived at the farm. I immediately got out of the car and hugged Molly. My parents always got angry when I hugged her since I'd smell like her for the rest of the day. I put my leash on her and asked my dad if I could take her for a walk. He always thought that we would go down a road and back, but I always kind of found it more interesting to take her to the forest. I always felt a certain kind of peace and relaxation there that was unmatched by anything else. So we took a turn and headed to the forest. Usually when there, I would take her leash off so she could explore on her own. Most of the time I'd carve my name into the trees or look for anything interesting. I was playing baseball with some rocks and a wooden leg, presumably from an old table. That's when I heard it. Molly was barking at something. This wasn't the usual bark when we're in the forest. I thought it was a fox or some other animal, so I quickly grabbed the wooden leg like a weapon. I knew that if it was a fox, it wouldn't attack but I had a sense of security while I was holding it. I called out, Molly? She continued barking. This was very strange, since she always comes when I call her. I followed the sound of her barks and stumbled across a scene I will never forget. There was a man, probably in his late fifties, half naked, carrying a large machete in one hand and holding moonshine in the other. This was the first time that I stumbled across someone in the woods, let alone half naked carrying a big ass machete. He was ignoring Molly completely and hacking away at the ground for some reason. I didn't really know how to handle the situation. Even now, I have no idea how I would handle it. Sir, are you okay? I asked in confusion. I don't think I understood the seriousness of the situation at the time. He turned around, revealing his face. He had some of the clearest blue eyes I have ever seen to this day. I could see them so well because they were so wide. Come here, boy. Look what I've dug up. I was afraid that I didn't listen to him. He would start to chase me, and that was something I wanted to avoid at all costs. I got closer but kept a good distance. I didn't see anything except for an empty hole. He returned to hitting the ground with his machete, occasionally taking sips from the bottle. 
I used this window of time to get my dog and started walking away slowly, as to not notify him that I was leaving. But then I took one final glance at the man. His head was dug deep in the hole. I was intrigued, so I kept looking. I know it was foolish of me. He got up from the ground, and I was shocked when I saw him carrying a bone in his mouth. I have no idea which animal it belonged to, if it even did belong to an animal. I had seen enough and began sprinting away with my dog. As we ran, I heard him laughing. And that's when I saw something flying from the corner of my eye. It was the machete. I heard him yell, Damn it. This made me run even faster. I knew the forest very well, so I wasn't afraid of getting lost. I ripped through branches and bushes until I got out of there and didn't stop sprinting until I arrived at the garage, where my father was testing out lights on our tractor. I didn't tell him a single thing about the man, since I was afraid that he would get angry and would never allow me to walk Molly anymore. Needless to say, I never went to that forest alone again. Man with the machete and bone in his mouth. I have no intention of coming across you again. This happened a few years ago, while I was still in high school, and live feed cameras, door ring cameras, were first becoming a thing. Must have been about 2014. I used to go running in the woods right by my house in upstate Washington. The trail began very steep, almost like a hike, and then became more flat and steady. That's where I would begin my runs. I would run every day roughly around the same time in the morning, roughly dawn, and the afternoon, before and after school. I was running before school one morning, and a tall man with a beard and a plain tan hat was sitting on the bench at the beginning of the trail. I hated dealing with people because I was an awkward teenager, so I began to look at the ground and just walk by him. As I got closer, I could tell that he was staring at me. I walked past him, and as I was going up the trail, I slightly turned around and saw that he stood up and was walking the trail behind me. Keep in mind, the sun is barely coming up, so it's mostly still dark. Then, I ran. This was not my normal jog, I was sprinting. No one was ever on this trail in the morning, and I'd never seen him before, and for some reason he creeped me out. I knew I could go through the forest, basically to my backyard, so I wasn't that worried, but I was afraid he was going to attack me or something. As I got further down the trail, I lost him, so I slowed down because frankly I was out of breath. Then I heard a man's voice say loudly, well, aren't you going to introduce yourself? That's when I lost it. I called my mum and told her I thought someone was following me on the trail. I told her a brief version of what happened, and she instructed me that she could meet me with her car at the head of the trail just in case the man was following me. She didn't want him to know where we lived. I went down a side trail that cut short to the head of the trail and was looking out for the man the whole time. I jumped into my mom's car and started crying. I didn't remember why. I just remember being so afraid that I was going to be taken. The rest of my day went normally. I went to school, went to all my classes, and for the most part forgot about the ordeal. The rest of the week was normal, until Friday night on my way home from school. I stopped at the grocery store, and on the way out I swore I saw the man. I thought I was imagining it. So I walked to my car and drove home. I did not do much on weekends. I stayed home, chilled with my family, smoked with my friends, and that was about it. I was up late with my friend Josh, watching bad movie after bad movie, and then we started to hear a knocking on the window at around 3am. I had some annoying middle school kids in my neighbourhood who were always pulling pranks. So although it was creepy, being the macho kids we were, we ignored it, and tried playing it off like we were ignoring the annoying middle schoolers. The knocking then transferred from the back room we were in to the windows by the front door. In the morning, I told my parents and my dad checked the ring camera. 
It was the man. There was a multitude of clips of him. First, a couple of him walking past the cameras as he was walking back and forth in front of the house to see if he could see inside. Then a few clips of him stepping back and looking up as if he was trying to look into the upstairs window from afar. These clips ended at 1.45 in the morning. Then around 3 to 3.05 a.m., he showed up again and he was tapping the window and we could see him in the camera. At one point he stood back and realized the camera and just stared at it. He did this a few times and then at one point got really close to it and whispered something like, how was your run? He smiled and walked away. My dad called the police and had them come to our house. He showed them the camera footage, but since we didn't have cameras in our house or the back, we could not prove he was trespassing and there's nothing illegal about talking to someone's doorbell. I never saw him again. And when the police checked back in the following month, they said they thought that once he saw the camera, he freaked out and decided he was caught and to stop whatever he was planning to do. It was just totally horrifying. I was literally being stalked. I'm a guy, so something like this has never happened to me and thankfully hasn't happened since. Safe to say, after these events, I got a gem membership. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under our canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbanks, lake shores, ridges, bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game and I'm establishing this because it's important you understand I've heard, seen and smelt about all this region has to offer in way of wilderness. My scariest experience though happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring. So the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed, that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in thick underbrush. Young maple and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. And that's when I heard a loud crack and froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing. Dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instincts though. The thought that something flashed in my mind as I stood there balancing myself into silence was, if I hear it again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not just a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was damn sure I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice, well, that meant I had to get the hell out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decently sized wooden stick be violently shaken and whacked against a smallish tree. More a fungo bat sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack and not a thud or thump. And I have described it as explosive in the past as it was so sudden and terribly loud. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there completely spooked, I realized the soon to be worse part of my situation. I knew where the sound came from and I knew where the trail went, in about 30 yards. I was going to come to an 180 degree turn and start up the ridge, going away from the creek. This meant, as soon as I got the courage to move towards the noise, 
I was going to have to turn back to it and get up that ridge, and this made me very nervous. My head somewhere between meth fiend murderer and Bigfoot bludgeoning. Minutes pass. I just breathe my foggy breath into my glasses and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light. I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep to the 180 turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts big black moving shadows on the trail, and that didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen while going up the trail. And then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking fast, and by the time I made the top of that ridge, I was huffing, and first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in our woods, I've smelt it all, and I'm telling you, I don't know what the hell that was. Deadfall and especially leafed out branches make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard it many times, but I just don't know what the hell that was. This happened about five years ago, when I was in high school. After school, me and two friends decided to go to our local bayou and explore the nearby woods. It's not the first time I had ventured into these woods. I actually grew up riding my dirt bike in them. But as we were walking through, we saw a very old looking entrance to a path in the woods. It was an arch made up of dozens upon dozens of sticks and twigs, and us being young, we decided it would be a good idea to get on our hands and knees and crawl through this sketchy structure. Obviously not the right decision. It could have been a booby track or something. Luckily it wasn't, and we continued on our adventure into the depths of the forest. After following this path for a short amount of time, we stumbled upon a tent and a wooden structure next to it that created a roof of sorts. We called out to the tent and asked if anyone was there, before deciding that it must be vacant. Since we're troublemakers, I think it's pretty obvious that we raided it next. Tucked in the roof of that wooded structure were machetes, pellet guns, and on the ground trash bags, filled with a bunch of random containers and stuff which struck me as sort of strange. It seemed as if someone actually lived there. Inside the tent laid a mattress, and right next to it was a giant bong and since I was a stoner at the time, I called out dibs as fast as I could. My friend sighed and told me I could keep it. Luckily, the retail value of the thing was about $250. But unfortunately, someone ended up stealing it from me not long after I originally obtained it. There was also some Jack Daniels, some blueberry vodka, which I snatched up too. So I ended with most of it for myself. It was starting to get dark. At the opposite end of this clearing was a trail that was covered in little tea light candles still lit. There must have been hundreds of these things. The trail wasn't very long and ended up leading back to the tent. So it just kind of looped around. But still, you have to be very meticulous to take hundreds of tea lights and lay them out on both sides of the path that was a couple of dozen feet long and then light them one by one. After that, we decided to get the hell out of there before some homeless guy came back to find out we snuck through their camp and stole some stuff. Looking back, I think we might have actually stumbled on a makeshift lab. Why else would there be a few trash bags lying around filled with all sorts of various canisters and containers? 
I really think whoever lived there was cooking up some shake. I could be wrong though, but all I know was that place was sketchy. I ended up going back a few times even by myself, and it looked like the area had since been abandoned, with the tent and mattress being burnt to the ground. That area looked different in the dark, especially when I was alone. It had an eerie feeling to it, but that's not all. The candles were still lit. Panic spread throughout me, and I ran the hell out of there never to return again. I was in Big Bend National Park about 20 years ago, prepping for a backpacking series presentation for REI. Big Bend is the western portion of Texas that dips towards along the bend of the Rio Grande that forms the border with Mexico. It's mixed high desert and smaller mountains, gorgeous place, great history. I was hiking the area near Santa Elena Canyon, probably a couple of hours before sunset to try and get pics for the presentation. This area of the park opens into a comparatively flat section of the basin, where the river broadens and the wildlife tends to be more diverse and obvious. I was several hundred meters away from my van, which was parked in a designated lot at what passed for a trailhead at the time. As I approached the river basin near the mouth of my canyon, I saw something really unusual. So unusual in fact, it took a few seconds for my brain to sort the puzzle. Something was moving on the other side of the river, and it was big, man-sized, but low to the ground. The color of a deer, perhaps? And shuffling along. It looked, for first impression, to be a medium-sized white tail, though, lying on its side and moving like a snake. But that's not a thing that happens, so I moved in a bit to improve my line of sight. It was a mountain lion, a big cat, a very big cat. It was creeping along, low slung, hunting something that was probably no more than a stone's toss from where I was standing. I'd never seen one before. And when the visual information finally passed, I think my blood froze. Then it looked at me. I'll probably never forget that bit. You could see that little calorie calculator turn on in its eyes. I've never been so thankful for a river in my life. Granted at this time, and maybe still, the river was very low due to the drought and unauthorized and unlawful irrigation practices upstream. And you could likely cross at several points at this location with minimal risk. But it was still quite broad and definitely looked like part of a potent water barrier. Death Kitty does a series of double takes, head shifting from me to whatever the prey location was back and forth rapidly. Said calorie calculator and risk calculator trying to get a fix on this evening's menu. I die a little inside, maintain my facing and begin slowly and quietly moving away. Not sure if I was worth it, if the river was too much of an X factor, or if the big one just really wasn't that into me. But no chase was given, and after breaking line of sight, I was able to get back into the van just fine with no signs of pursuit, and some mild trachycardia. That was the longest short walk I've ever taken. Later that night I was parked off the main park road, in an area where big cats commonly hunted. I'll always remember being parked there in the middle of nowhere, munching on slightly stale Oreos and a bottle of water, listening to the occasional growl or scream of a big cat peel out of the darkness, and being thankful for my relatively fortunate position on the food chain. Also, one night while I was on NyQuil, I hallucinated after getting a respiratory illness and woke up screaming. At a mountain, at 3am, at the public campsite, but that's someone else's scary story. I live just where farmland meets the outer edge of suburbia, on an island off the coast of British Columbia. 
The climate here is sub-temperate rainforest, so the natural and untouched landscape is incredibly wild, dense and lush. I'm a keen endurance cyclist and I take full advantage of the trail network in the forest surrounding my area. I work long hours, so most of my winter rides are in complete darkness with my trusty trail light. One section of my home trail winds through a rainforest bog full of trees, hundreds of feet tall. It's absolutely beautiful in the daytime. It feels like a magical place with shafts of sunlight piercing through the fog. Hundreds of different species of flora and fauna and so many wild animals coming and going along game trails. At night, my gut starts to tighten as the thought of passing through this mile long section of trail. One day, about a year ago, I was lucky enough to get a chance for a day ride. So I took it. It was a cold and very rainy winter day, with very few people out on the trail. I had packed thermos of hot coffee in my backpack. And I thought the forest bog was a good a place as any to have a break to stretch my legs and drink my coffee. I have an interest in botany. So I was looking closely at the lichens growing on a huge Douglas fir. Suddenly, I felt distinctly not alone. No biggie, lots of people use this trail, although not so many were out that day because the weather was so wet and cold. Then I heard it. A meow. That's odd. This isn't a good place for a cat to be out alone. We have lots of cougars and bears. Then I heard it again. Except it was weird sounding, almost like a robotic sound, like someone was playing a bad audio file of a cat. My gut started to clench. It sounded wrong somehow and I couldn't figure out why. My hands were shaking when I unzipped my backpack to put my coffee thermos back in. I felt waves of nausea roll over me as the air suddenly felt strangely dense and thick. I was in a rainforest surrounded by trees and moss, but I felt like I couldn't get enough oxygen. I hadn't seen anyone for at least 10 miles and I was distinctly aware of how far I was from anyone and how my phone didn't get reception here. Then I heard it again, louder and closer and even more wrong. But this was like no cat I've ever heard. It sounded like an imitation of a cat or a person saying meow. It was somehow also tiny, cold and robotic. Right, it was time to leave. As soon as I got out of the bog, I rode the rest of the way home like a bat out of hell, glancing over my shoulder every few minutes. There was nothing there that I could see. I will never forget this experience for as long as I live. I've had some pretty disturbing things happen on my night forest rides, but nothing has ever spooked me like that strange and wrong meowing in the middle of the afternoon. This happened quite recently. My brother and I went for a hike to stave off cabin fever from self isolating. We chose a pretty remote trail to lower the risk of coming into contact with other people. I was walking ahead of my brother, and the gravel on the tracks was making our footsteps sound really loud. Deep in my thoughts, I was listening to the rhythm of his footsteps behind me. About 20 minutes in, I started hearing other footsteps starting off faint and getting louder until they were the same pitch as his, but they were much faster, like a running rhythm. They suddenly came to a halt and I could hear the motion of someone stopping on gravel, that sudden sharp and rocky sound. If you can imagine it, I assumed there must have been someone running slash jogging on the track. And sure enough, I saw a shadow to the side of me appear which looked like a person's head next to mine, as though they were right behind me. I stopped and turned around to let them pass because the track was narrow. However, when I turned, it was just my brother staring back at me. He was confused as to why I'd stopped. So I asked if he was running a second ago when he said no. I asked if there had been anyone behind him. And he said that he wasn't aware of anyone. 
I thought it was strange, but just let it go and carried on. About five minutes later, we came around a corner, and there was the smell of just pure death, like a really strong off meat smell. We figured it was a dead animal and kept going. We reached the hike lookout after 20 minutes, chilled for a bit and then headed back. We passed the death smell, and then around the exact same spot where it had happened before I started hearing the running sound again. I ignored it this time, because it was starting to freak me out, and just picked up the pace to get back to the car. I told my mom and she joked that the death smell must have been a dead jogger, and I was being haunted by them, to which I laughed. But now I'm wondering, what if it was? Should I have gone and investigated the smell? I like to explore and fish a lot. They coincide a lot, so it's a pretty big passion of mine. I was hiking along a creek in a rural county near my home, in some dense game lands about eight or so miles from any house, probably at least double that from a major road or settlement. I had hiked for a while, and was hardly seeing any sign of human presence. Nearly every place I go in my state, I can find garbage, hunting trash, or any other sign that people have been there. If I see nothing, it is sort of a good sign that the area is undisturbed. As I was hiking, I heard gunshots far away. Not uncommon either, but the forest was oddly quiet, and yes, cliche incoming. I felt super uneasy, as if there was someone else there. Eventually, I found something really strange, and I've looked for the picture forever but can't find it. It was a small metal box, and I was well versed enough to know it was a geocache out in the open at the base of a tree. Let me remind you, this is several miles through thick woods and no sign of human habitation or influence. The box was rusty and looked to have been through a lot. I tried opening it, but a lot of sediment and rust had accumulated and I got a little give, but nothing significant. There was definitely stuff rattling around, so I tried a ton and nothing would work. I realized it wasn't going to open, so I left it as I found it and put a piece of duct tape on the tree next to it to find it again. I left and went home, downloaded the geocaching app, but the box wasn't registered anywhere, nor were there really any geocaches along that creek at all, none registered for miles, so either it wasn't a geocache or maybe just really old. Anyway, the very next day I went back armed with a crowbar, hammer and pliers, I went back to the exact spot it was in, as I had put the duct tape right around the ground besides the tree, but the box was nowhere to be found. I looked all around and couldn't find it, at which point several miles from civilization and several more from cell service, I booked it out there. I realized that this isn't spooky or supernatural, but it put me on the edge more than anything else I've ever been through. I live in rural Australia. One early summer afternoon, I was bushwalking down a big ass hill, which has a river down at the bottom. From the peak of the hill to the base is about 500 meters. However, the track sort of snakes in back and forth like an S shape, as it's too steep of a hill to just go straight down. About a third of the way down, I spotted a pair of feet from about the ankles down sticking out between some bushes, with the feet running perpendicular to the track. As I got closer, I could see that a man was lying down there, and based on his body position assumed he was resting, and likely homeless and or disoriented, seeking shade from the summer sun, further adding to my theory that he was homeless. He had long hair, a long head, and was wearing track pants, and it was 35 degrees Celsius at least. I got about 100 meters from where I saw the man, and was now on a section of the track, 
running parallel and below to where he was, now walking in the opposite direction. I had followed a curve on the track S. I saw that this man was suddenly running down. Seeing this unnerved me, as based on his outfit, he did not appear to be a local jogger. As fight or flight began to kick in, I pulled out my inhaler, took a puff, and pretended that I was about to start jogging. I wanted to commit to my act, in case I had judged him wrongly, and he was really a local jogger, albeit a poorly dressed one. He continued to run after me along the track, and I was about two thirds of the way down, when I noticed he was running too hard to merely be a jogger. He was running closer to a sprinting pace than a jog, which as most people know is a terrible idea when running downhill, let alone in 35 plus degree heat, in track pants, and with no visible water bottle. As he gained ground on me, I decided to sit on my ass and slide down the hill, between sections of the track that ran parallel to one another. Once I finally made it to the bottom, and across to the other side of the river, I turned and saw he had stopped running. I continued to walk along the river, when after about five steps I heard him yell out something obscene. I continued to run on and off until I made my way back to the nearest road, and am yet to return to that track. I live in a downtown area of a relatively small city. A couple blocks from my house, there is a lake with a five mile trail around it. In the daytime, it is absolutely beautiful and a very popular attraction, but it tends to be sketchy at night because it's located in a lesser part of town with a much higher homeless and gang population. After dark, some questionable people can appear and mixed with the eeriness of the lake itself is pretty scary. I've had some pretty strange encounters there, but nothing terrified me as much as this one. This happened about a year ago. The sun was starting to set, and I was questioning whether I should run or not. I should have known not to run if I was questioning it. So I decided I'd do, and set off on my run. I quickly learn that it is getting dark fast. One and a half miles in, it's pitch black, only with the occasional street light giving me something. Around two miles, I look ahead and see a guy just standing in the middle of the path. As I get closer, this dude just whips it out and starts peeing in the middle of the path, like blatantly. I slow my pace down to assess the situation. Now keep in mind I'm 19, 6 foot, 180 pounds of pure muscle, so I'm not easily intimidated. But this was giving me a very uneasy feeling. I run around the dude on the complete opposite side of the road, and he's just staring at me the whole time. I'm getting freaked out at this point, so I pick up my pace a little bit, and out of my comfort zone. It was too late to turn back since I'm already two miles out. Up ahead, I begin to see another guy standing there. I have no idea of what's going on at this point, so I run around him as well. Another half mile up and there's another guy, and this time he's just staring at me. I'm completely freaked now, so I start sprinting my butt off. Another half a mile from my house, and I hear this ear-piercing screaming behind me. It's like it's coming from 20 different people but it keeps getting closer as I was sprinting. I book it, with all I've got to my house and slam the door. I couldn't sleep for the next two nights. It could have just been some weird homeless guys drugged out, but it could have been much worse. Moral of the story, be aware of your surroundings, runners, especially at night. I went on a midnight walk with my girlfriend, the park by her house has a dirt trail that led up a small mountain. It was about a 30 minute walk to the top, but the view overlooking the city was gorgeous. At the top, the dirt path became paved concrete with a small sitting area. We stayed at the top for about 30 minutes. Upon leaving is where things got creepy. As we started to head back down, 
at the point where the concrete met dearth path. There was a large pile of trash bags in a crescent shape in the corner of the path's intersection. It was not there when we first arrived. The pile was much too large and in the way for someone who likes to cut corners of paths to notice. My girlfriend remarked at how the shape resembled a dead body and asked me if I had noticed it on the way up. I was very sure that it was not there 30 minutes prior when we arrived. I was extremely sure. Nonetheless, there was no reason to freak my anxiety prone girlfriend out. So I laughed and said, yeah, it must have been there and it was probably trash. Visibility was extremely low, probably about five yards. And I didn't want to freak her out. But I was pretty tilted. And I got heckled for being drunk and not listening to her. But in actuality, I was looking and listening for any signs of people around us. In my own head, I was telling myself that I'm just being paranoid. And that it was probably there and I didn't notice it to begin with. But at the same time, I was also sure that it wasn't. I'm sorry I didn't have time to listen to your story about Jesse from work. I'm worried about our safety at the moment. We made it back to our car without running into anyone. But I kind of laughed at myself for being worried about nothing. And also felt the relaxation of my butt muscles that had been clenched for the last half hour. A few days later, the local news covered a dead body found near a park in Anthem at the top of the mountains. Guys, it was actually a dead body. Literally getting chills just saying that. It was actually someone dead. Thank God that my girlfriend didn't watch the news or she'd have probably shat herself. When I was around 10 years old and feeling adventurous, I would go riding my bike down my parents road which was dead ended two miles down at the only neighbor's house, or exploring around in the endless acres of pasture surrounding our house. We were way out in the boonies, the back of one pasture sloped down to a slough slash creek, which fed into a small pond in our neighbor's pasture. The area had some woods around it. And I decided it was a good place to return to play. The neighbors were an older couple who had lived in the area for years and never really went anywhere. And I didn't think they would mind if I played there. One day I was playing around the pond and found a lot of mussels, like oysters, buried in the mud. I dug a couple and took them home. A few days later in the same spot, it looked like a lot more had been dug up and they had been opened and eaten, which would be okay for a raccoon or something but there were some big boot prints that couldn't possibly have been mine. I should have had a lot more sense, but I kept going back after finding things. Once there was a plastic bag full of trash, some ripped up clothes and a tarp. They were still down there next time I came back, and I heard a car coming down the road. I laid my bike down and hid in the slough. It was dried up at this point about four feet deep, on the other side of the pond and a man pulled up coming from the neighbor's end of the road in a black boxy looking car, maybe a Cadillac, and got out wearing a suit. He grabbed the trash bag and clothes and threw the bones in a hole, looked around, got back in the car and headed out of there quickly. I went back after he left and looked at the bones and took one of them home. I pedaled as fast as my short stubby legs would go. My dad said it looked like a deer or cow bone and threw it out. It wasn't until I started studying pre med in college that I realized it was a human radius, likely that of a woman or older child. My ex boyfriend and I did a rainforest walk which drops deep down to the bottom of the forest. No other cars in the car park. And I didn't come across any other hikers. We had it all to ourselves and had a great time for the most part. As we were walking up, my ex was ahead of me. 
and they suddenly stopped, raising his hand up to signal for me to stop with him. I looked up, and there was this woman standing up ahead of us, staring. She appeared normal, but I got a chill as soon as I looked at her. She had dark brown hair, which I only noticed because it contrasted so strongly against a cardigan. The cardigan was all I could focus on. It went right down to her feet and was bleach white, totally clean, as if it had just been brought off the rack. I thought about how ridiculous it was to wear this thing while hiking. We stood there totally motionless, just staring back at her for 30 to 40 seconds. We didn't immediately feel threatened, but there was no way I was going to take a step forward towards her. Instead, I felt this kind of weird stillness as if the forest around us froze and time went silent. She finally turned around and began to walk away up the trail. We watched her and waited, not saying another word until she was out of sight before we began to walk. The car park was around a half hour away and we walked in silence, both a bit on edge and trying to listen for any suspicious sounds. We didn't see her or anyone else for the rest of the trail. Still no cars in the car park when we returned. It was absolutely the strangest experience I've ever had outdoors. Earlier this summer, I was hiking in the 100 mile wilderness in Maine. A couple of days into my trip, I got really sick. Sore throat, headache, fatigue, loss of appetite, about the worst cocktail of symptoms for hiking any long distance. I had found a tick on me and was terrified I might have Lyme disease. I decided to get off trail and see a doctor, which is easier said than done in the most remote, inaccessible sections of the whole Appalachian Trail. Thankfully, there are old logging roads which crisscross the wilderness. So I decided to turn off onto a road which I was told led to a campground. There I hoped to find some day hikers and get a ride into town. As soon as I turned off the Appalachian Trail, it started pouring with rain, which only increased my misery. A few minutes later, I noticed a dog in the woods. Strange, I thought. Then I saw another dog, and another, and another, and about a dozen big hunting hounds fenced off randomly in the middle of nowhere, Maine. They barked at me, slavering, and pawed at the chicken wire fence, which did not seem strong enough to hold them. This was slightly disconcerting, but the brown trouser moment came when I spotted a lone figure in the woods what seemed to be a tall man in a hooded blue rain jacket and pants. I couldn't see his face, and he just stood there, still as a statue, severely spooked. I hiked out of there on the double. In the backcountry, it's generally good manners to say hello and exchange pleasantries. But this guy didn't say a word. Maybe it was because of the rain. Maybe he was feeding bodies to his hounds out there. I'll never know. But he definitely saw me, and I could tell that he was watching me go past. I was walking a trail alone one evening, around a huge bluff that sticks up maybe 40 feet tall. The hike is a 1.5 mile hike. As I was on it, I got a call from my girlfriend at the time, so I answered and began to talk to her. It started to get dark and I was dragging my feet along as we got chatting. All of a sudden, I started hearing rustling all around me. Growing up in a rural area of Illinois, I had a good sense of what was a pack of coyotes. I told my girl I was being followed and needed to have my wits about me. She was a little freaked but understood. I hung up and grabbed my pocket knife and found a stick I could whittle into a point as quickly as I could. As I'm walking down the trail, I could hear the rustling getting closer and closer, turning from stereo sound to 7.1 Dolby to put it plainly. At this point I knew I was surrounded by them, but couldn't see them. I was on the cusp of a hill, and I wanted to get a good vantage point to defend myself if it were to come to that. As I get to the top of the hill, 
I notice a doe just over the ridge, maybe 20 yards past it. The rustling had stopped. Everything was quiet. I realized that the coyotes weren't after me, but clearly hunting this deer, which was odd to begin with. I finally yelled, and the deer looked back, saw me, and took off like a bat out of hell. The second the deer moved, four coyotes came from behind me and ran full sprint past me, practically scraping my jeans as they passed, and I came careening down the side of the bluff. I stood there for a few minutes trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I haven't taken that trail since. It was pretty damn scary. I grew up in the woods, never had an encounter like that, and hope to never have one like that again. This happened about three years ago, when some friends and I went hiking on the Appalachian Trail in North Carolina, close to Boone but still a good 30 minutes drive from the start of the trail. We get in a few hours before we start to make camp, so we could beat the time and enjoy the mountain scenery at dusk before it gets dark. We set up, tie our food and things in the tree, roll a joint, crack open a few, and enjoy the mountain face overlooking the valley. Truly, the Appalachians are drop-dead gorgeous. Then we hear it. There's just this blood-curdling scream out of nowhere, and it seemed to come from our east, opposite from our campground and the trail. We are all immediately freaked out, with a couple of us yelling out, and one or two pulling out their pistols. We all just stand frozen for a moment, then we hear it again, and then silence. Like that horror movie silence when everything, the trees, the birds, and the wind, just stop. You could hear everyone breathing, like it was in your ear. None of us had cell service, and it was too dark to make our way to anything like civilization. So the four of us just holed up together without sleeping until daybreak. Still a bit freaked, we made our way back to our cars and the parking lot. Now the trails kind of buckle and intersect at time in this area. So we get back, and we'd come close to where we heard the origin of the scream. And lo and behold, we found cougar tracks. We hurried back and contacted the local ranger station to let them know. And the ranger sighed and said, Yeah, you're not the first to tell us this. So bottom line, those big cats aren't gone. I spent the majority of my life in Pennsylvania. So a majority of my hikes have been in the Pennsylvania wilderness. In northeastern Pennsylvania, around the Appalachian Trail, the homeless people congregate and form communities. This isn't creepy as it gets cold up there. I'm sure it takes a community working together to get through the winters outside. While hiking, it's not unusual to stumble across a community. The creepy part? It is known on the trail that they protect their camps with extreme violence, that if you find one to not to disturb anything. These communities can be pretty big, with 20 to 30 makeshift tents and shelters set up in the middle of the woods. When you accidentally wander across one of the camps, they are always empty. But the fires are still going, and food is still cooking. So you know there is a bunch of people straight up watching you that are hiding. I always tried to make sure that I wasn't intentionally looking at any of their tents or belongings, and made sure to make my way out of there as fast as possible. Never once have I seen one of them. So it really makes you feel not that safe. Any time I wandered into a camp, I made a mental note to never hike that area again, unless in a group. I used to live out in the middle of nowhere. The town had less than 200 people in it. I used to work through the night in one of the metro areas and it was about a 40 minute drive with about 15 of it on a country road. I used to think I would see stuff in the fields, like coyote, deer all the time. Never thought twice. Well, one morning I was on my way home at roughly 3am, 
and we had a little bridge to cross right before we got to our road. As I'm closing in on crossing the bridge, I can see something pearly white hanging out in the middle of the road. I thought it was probably a swan and it would move. As I got closer, I realized that swans are not that big. I was in an F-150 and it was an eye level with me. When its wings opened up, it literally covered both lanes of traffic. I swerved to miss it, but hit something of the wing. I slammed on my brakes and turned around. Whatever it was, was 100% gone without a trace, and I never saw it again. If it was a bird, it's the biggest bird I've ever seen. Oh, and I also need to let you know that I didn't live by any large body of water. When my sister and I were younger, we used to go to Faxon Park in Quincy and spend hours exploring the woods. Not a lot of woods in a suburban city, so we took advantage of what we had. One day we were pretty deep in there and came upon a clearing. There were a couple of fire rings and three trees had been cut down, stripped and propped together to make a tripod. There was a length of frayed rope hanging from the middle. There were some empty booze bottles and trash strewn about, and a few logs arranged like benches. The whole arrangement reminded us of a courtroom. There was nothing overly creepy about this scene at the moment, but we felt a little uneasy knowing that something had gone to the trouble to set all of this up in the middle of the woods. Cut to a week later, I'm reading the local paper, and the front page has a story about a homeless man that was murdered in Faxon Park. Turns out another homeless dude got into an argument with him. A group of them had been drinking in the woods and strung him up by his feet in a makeshift tripod and held their own trial before beating him to death. We had unknowingly stumbled upon the crime scene. To this day, I'm ever so thankful that we didn't find the body. I'd like to begin by describing myself, because it is relevant to the story. I'm 25, male. I'm a 25 year old male around average height. I've been doing sports five to six times a week since I graduated high school. Gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sports my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I just recently purchased a new pair of high altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that is surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break into my boots last Saturday. More specifically, because it would have been my granddad's birthday, and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots are overkill for the woods, but I needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers, and set off at about nine in the morning. It rained the day before, so I experienced a fair amount of mud and not so many people, as they are easily scared off by the weather. Since the summer was excruciatingly hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not so distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she does not enjoy long distance walks anymore. My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice. So I knew from the moment I woke up that I would be doing this hike alone. The first half of the hike was perfect. The altitude difference along the trail is minimal and I barely broke a sweat and misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met, at most, six to seven people during the first two to three hours, 
and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks, as there are deer and wild boar in these woods. Nothing more menacing. Not animals, anyway. But I won't get ahead of myself. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt, but deep in the forest, and can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred metres. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older, green SUV, with a fresh registration. You can tell by the license plate. Probably an important detail. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time. Then I heard it come back. It drove past me for the second time. Now, very slowly, I could see clearly that two men were sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble slash beard game going on as well, and I assumed that they were gamekeepers. Even though those cars have a crest on the hood and on both of the front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things. I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this. They have jeeps, which are more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort and again thought nothing of it. Then my trail left the asphalt road and began sneaking into the woods again. I walked ahead serenely, gazing at trees and whatnot. Then suddenly, had the strange sensation that something, or someone, was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point on the trail, it was quite narrow. But if, for whatever reason, you want to drive your car on it, you could just about. Now when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped, just as I had. I looked at the driver, who was staring back, as I can only assume this because he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, What's wrong? Shall I let you go? In a polite tone, as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and soon he disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point I wasn't scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air, and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car and the engine, stop behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination, at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again or see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water, as I usually do, I needed to go, and I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail, that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I don't know what they're called in English. You know, the wooden structures, a couple of meters tall, very simple, where hunters can sit and wait for their prey. Yeah, you get what I mean. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder, that led up it, and began to urinate. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of my water. 
I'd been camping there for a good few minutes before I decided to go back to the trail, where I deviated from in order to take the leak. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind. There was absolutely nothing. This made me realize just a moment later how alone I was. Except for the man who was standing 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back onto the trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees, and you couldn't see the main trail, as it was running perpendicular to the small one. I looked at him, and was instantly chilled to the very bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing with a baseball hat on his head. I believe the only reason he was standing still was the moment of surprise when I had appeared from a place that he had not anticipated. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail thinking he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV, from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also probably illegal to hunt in these woods at this time of the year. I figured, in the matter of two seconds, that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion, towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf, or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot, and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right, it's the best call I've ever made, and for God's sake, he began running towards me. Adrenaline blossoming within me, I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted. It must have been several kilometers. I even crossed some smaller trails, but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was at a billion the whole time. I began checking for a phone signal, but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate and after a while I began power walking, but still off trail. Straight ahead, in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me seriously. They said I was overreacting. You must not have understood the situation. Well, I'll let you decide for yourself if I did or not. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like an eternity. But I walked the last kilometre to the main square. I took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to a station near my car rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in, and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was back from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing. She must have felt that something had shaken me up, and I spent the afternoon contemplating my life in the bathtub. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for large periods of time. I called the forest gamekeeper's office, and I inquired about whether they had such cars in their service as the ones I had come across. They do not. The gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're alone. I told them my story, and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police would not. No one could have been legally hunting in that area during summer. I've been reading the local news, but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really do hope nothing will be reported either. 
I've been going to therapy for about a month now, and in receiving therapy, I've been revisiting past experiences and finally leaving them to rest. One of the memories is from when I was about eight. I was living in a rural area, my house facing a cemetery, and more graves than the inhabitants of the town I lived in. It was a quiet, peaceful place, a place of serene silence, about nine or ten blocks from the north side of the cemetery is a secluded creek, which leads to a forest area. I had two very close friends. Sarah was my age. Daniel was two years older than us. Daniel had two cousins, one of which was old enough to drive. One slow, hot Saturday afternoon, Danny's cousin suggested we go out, get ice cream, and drive up to the lake. We all got in the pickup truck, Danny and his younger cousin riding in the bed, and Sarah and I in the back seat. We passed into a small store, picking up ice cream, bottled water, and fruits. Ice creams in hand, windows rolled down, and classic rock from the radio had us hyped up for a swim. In the excitement, we made a wrong turn and found ourselves at a lesser used path to the creek. The older cousin didn't feel like driving anymore, so we decided to take our things and wade our feet into the creek. We got out, and immediately I began to get this strange feeling. I could feel the hairs stand on end. Slight discomfort was washing over me. We began to walk the path, Danny chasing Sarah under the threat of getting a bug on her, and I shook the feeling off. Instead, enjoying the crisp air and the sound of running water. After a good seven minute walk, we reached a large rock, where we settled our things and stepped into the creek. We splashed around, collecting rocks that shone brilliantly under the water, oblivious to the world. I decided to walk up to the rock, because I began to crave watermelon. I sat down and it hit me. The uncomfortable wave washed over me. An intense feeling that I could only describe as vulnerable. It was as if I were completely naked, being stripped of all forms of innocence and safety. I could feel eyes on my back, so I decided to turn around, fear-stricken. At first I couldn't see anything. I couldn't tell why I had felt so paranoid. After looking for a while, I saw something shiny reflect light. It was brief and small, but I thought that maybe it was a littered bottle or a piece of trash. I could hear Dan calling for me to come back down. I rushed my way down and joined the group. I told the older cousin that I spotted something weird, but that I was too scared to go and check it out. He told me to ignore it. It was probably trash. But even with that, I still felt like something was wrong. We climbed back up to the rock, hydrating and eating between chats and giggles. The older cousin had his back to the creek, where he had a clear view of the same area I looked into. I had nearly forgotten all about my feeling when he stopped. His smile was gone, face pale. Placing his bottle down, he immediately got up and began to shout, Who's there? We all turned to look, and saw someone shoot out of the weeds. It looked like a man, and he ran with something in his hand. He started saying that the man looked like he was taking pictures of us with one hand. All the blood drained from my head. The fear that I hadn't spotted the man first, washing over me. How long had he been there? Had he been following us since we started walking in? We packed up and left, trying to forget the uncomfortable experience. It wasn't until two weeks after that, where the town was buzzing over to find a dead body in the creek. We weren't friendly with the caretaker of the cemetery, which was the cemetery chosen for the burial of the body, after he was identified. 
He told all of us that the victim was a teenager who was killed and dumped at the creek a week ago, leaving a disfigured, half-bloated, rotting mess. The murderer was a creepy middle-aged man who lived closer to the forested area. His cabin-like house was searched, and they found toys, collected missing children's clippings from newspapers, and hundreds of pictures of families, which focused on the kids and teenagers that hung out there after school. Sometimes I shudder at the thought that it was very possible that it was the very same guy who was at the creek, and that that could have been us. I live in a very small town. Everyone there pretty much knows everyone else. And unless you're visiting somewhere out of town, you can usually get anywhere you want by walking within 15 minutes at most. Because of this, it's also a very safe feeling place. A lot of people I know just leave their doors unlocked. I don't, because I have experience in other less safe locations. And our police report is actually a source of comedy because of some of the random and small crimes they have to respond to. But we also get a lot of tourists in the summer. And that's when I typically tend to avoid town because I don't like large crowds. These people are the types who get crazy drunk or high and just feel like they can do whatever they want due to the town's reputation as a relaxed place. But they're generally harmless, if not annoying. So one summer night, I was walking along a bike path to my house. This bike path runs right by a large forest that people like to hike through during the day. And I was currently a little ways in alongside it. It was getting close to midnight, more like 11.30. And so all I really had for light at the moment was my phone's flashlight since my town usually reserves street lights for inside the main areas. It was then that I heard what sounded like a woman screaming off in the woods. Now, of course, this startled me. But a moment to reconsider made me realize just how many things that could have been. Various animals have been described as making similar noises, or maybe some tourists were drunk and partying out by the lake there. However, I still found myself moving a bit further away from the woods as I continued walking. This screaming continued on and off, which freaked me out a bit more, but I was still theorizing on it being an animal. It wasn't until I heard what sounded like the screaming being muffled that I really panicked. It sounded unmistakably like a person putting their hand over someone else's mouth and I could hear more heavy breathing from that direction. As I continued walking at a faster pace, I dialed the police and told them that they may want to check out the forest, and I explained what I had heard. The guy I talked to agreed, and said that I didn't have to stay in the area if I didn't feel safe, but they would maybe need to call me to the situation for questioning if they found anything. Of course, I didn't want to stick around, so I told them as such and hung up. And then I saw a figure, out in the darkness, ahead, walking towards me. I audibly gasped, which I always used to think was a thing people say in horror stories to spice them up, but this was involuntary. Still not wanting to believe that I was in one of my worst nightmares, I figured that this was just possibly someone else who, like me, was using this path to get home. I figure we'd just pass each other, I'd momentarily have someone else's company and comfort, and we'd head our separate ways. The guy got closer to me, and I realized that he was walking towards me on my side with no intention of switching over to let me go. And every time I would switch sides, he would do the same. I also realized that regardless of how dark it is, I would have seen him coming on the bike path way before he got close, so he most likely went on the path from the forest. I turned back the way I came, 
and saw another figure behind me, standing still. I started to exit off the path and just make my way back into town from a back street. But as I started to go to the side, the guy finally spoke. And the freakiest thing about it is he sounded perfectly normal and not really creepy at all. In a tone of voice that would be just like most people speaking. Not your classic scary story creep. Why'd you call the cops? He said to me in a disappointed tone. Like how you'd ask a child why they lie to you. I took off running away from the bike path and up a random street that was nowhere near my house. I heard the footsteps of people giving chase and thought that it could have been my own imagination. But I just kept running. And since I'm not really in shape, I knew I'd eventually have to stop and catch my breath. But I could swear there were multiple sets of footsteps behind me. As in, more than the two people that I had already seen. Right as I was about to slow down, I heard the sound of a car getting closer, and the red and blue lights associated with the police could be seen coming. The footsteps behind me faded away, and soon disappeared altogether. I walked at a brisk pace the rest of the way home, and that was the end of it. I still don't know what any of that was, but I'm guessing nothing was found as I was never called down to the station for questioning. I don't really know how the police go about their business, as this was my first instance of ever having to call them, but I'm pretty sure that's why I wouldn't be called. To this day, I have yet to go hiking ever again there, or stay out past 10pm. So to the group of people who made it feel that I'll never be safe again, Let's not meet. I grew up in a house where my backyard was a huge forest in rural Illinois. When I was a kid, I loved being outdoors and would take every possible opportunity to run amok in the woods with my best friend. When we were younger, 11 or 12, we stayed closer to the house in the outskirts and climbed the trees. When we got to 13 to 15, we would venture deep, walking and swimming in the rivers, and building little forts. When I was 16, the forest was roped off and closed off to the public, as a company had been illegally dumping mercury into the woods, or lead, one of those two, but that's another story. It was the middle of a hot summer, and I was around 15 at the time. Dusk was approaching and my friend had to go home for dinner, but I wasn't quite ready to leave. We parted ways, and I climbed up a tree near my favourite spot over the river. Now these woods backed up to a local gun club, so it wasn't uncommon to hear shooting. However, this gun club was contained in its own private property, and the members never ventured out into the forest. I sat in my little tree for a bit and ate the blackberries that I'd picked earlier while watching it get dark, when I suddenly spotted movement out of the corner of my eye. At first I assumed it was a young deer, because it was large, but not huge, but I quickly realised it was a man. He seemed to be in his late thirties or early forties, and he wore a black t-shirt and camo pants with creepy wiry facial hair. He was skulking, like he didn't want to be seen. I thought this was odd, but I had no intention of making my presence known, since something felt wrong. And being a 15 year old girl alone in the woods, I knew that I was at a disadvantage. I slowed my breaths down and watched. At first he didn't say anything as he walked around the base of the trees. It was around that time that I realised he had a gun slung over his back. Once he got near a river where my friend and I had been loudly goofing off maybe 10 minutes earlier, he started calling out, Hey, anyone here? Help, while grabbing his rifle. There was no response and no noise. He gave up after a few minutes and began walking downstream. 
I waited until it was pitch black before sliding out of the tree as quietly as I could, running home and having my parents call the cops. They never found anything, but I could never bring myself to go back. I was with my brother-in-law in the Appalachians. It's usually snowy in December, but that year it was a constant 40 Fahrenheit or so, and too foggy to see very well. We made our way into a dense rainforest area and found what looked like an extremely overgrown, rarely trodden erosion forming a path. This didn't make sense. It was on the back of an inconvenient mountain peak and not on the way to anywhere, not even another trail. So we followed it. The deciduous canopy lay on the winter ground but little sunlight broke through anyway, due to the deep fog and mountain shadow. It felt haunted. We descended into a hollow with a small creek at the bottom, and rounded a bend into a dense clump of rhododendron. Inside this rhododendron bush, we started to see weird things, like decaying rope, rusted metal, paracords and supplies. Then the trail ended. Between two oak trees that formed a window through the brush, we could see a rusted body of metal with the face-sized holes of glass on the sides. We made out the shape of a small plane from the scattered pieces. The body was only in two pieces, but the wings were unrecognizable. There was a bit of graffiti on the plane, but not as much as you would expect. It had clearly been there a while but some of the original gear was still in the body. I wrote down the number on the side for reference. When I got home, I googled the plane number and found a result. Accident report March 1977. Western North Carolina. Damaged beyond repair. One passenger, one fatality, body recovered. Plane unsalvageable. We found this plane in 2016. The wreckage had been left there to rot for 39 years, and some of the gear had still not been stolen. I know it was only one death, but that place has a deeply unsettling aura. I'm not superstitious, nor do I believe in ghosts, but there was something strange about that place, and I won't forget it. I didn't crawl into the plane's body, both out of fear and because I wanted to be respectful to whoever died there. But I did take pictures of it all from the outside, which you can find in the description. I went hiking with a good buddy of mine in the Carolina Mountains in the middle of winter. We went way off trail, doing a full day's walk from where we'd parked. So by the time we set up camp, we were miles away from the nearest human. We pitch our tent and cook ourselves some food, and we're passing the whiskey flask back and forth, enjoying the near pitch black night and the stillness of our little fire. At first, we felt it, that sudden sensation of not being alone. Then after a few seconds, we heard something move in the darkness. We're frozen, we hear it again. But the most terrifying thing is that this time we realize whatever is out there, there's more than one of them, and they're big. My buddy and I lock eyes. We're too afraid to make any noise yet and come to a silent agreement that scaring these things off is our best chance. He grabs a thick branch from the fire and I grab one of the rocks we'd placed in a circle around it. I'm so scared that I can barely breathe. But together we yell as loudly as we possibly can and charge into the darkness. And then we saw the eyes. A dozen pair at least staring straight back at us. We had charged a ferocious pack of mountain ponies who didn't react at all to two crazy men yelling at the top of their lungs in the middle of the night. They just stared at us straight back totally unimpressed. Goddamn ponies. 
I've been hunting for a few years now, and I've seen my fair share of weird stuff. Mutilated rabbits killed by coyotes, among other things. Bobcat screams are also pretty freakish. But one day while walking on my property through the woods, I heard some branches quietly break about 30 yards ahead. Nothing too weird about that. Rabbits and coyotes bump into them all the time. It happened again, but this time a little closer, and to my right side. I unholstered my .45 XDS. I like the compact version because it feels better. Ready to shoot a hungry coyote. The day before, my neighbour told me how a woman in Little Elm got mauled by some pissed off coyotes a few days earlier. So I was ready to shoot. Anyway, I shined my flashlight through the trees and didn't see anything. I kept walking a little faster and I heard a high scream with low undertones. It didn't sound like nothing I've ever heard before. And I swear it sounded like a bobcat killed Batman. I took off sprinting back to my house a mile or so away. I'm near the woods tree line and look back to see a hunched shadow 40 yards staring behind me, like a person trying to walk on all fours. It was dark, so it may have been my imagination. I noped the hell out of there and got into my house. I haven't seen it since, and didn't sleep for a few nights. At the time, I wasn't hunting. I like to go for nighttime walks to clear my head, but I never go without a gun. Stay safe, and be careful because I don't know what that was.